Alrighty, welcome back everyone. We just talked about my best bets for this upcoming weekend. Feel pretty good about a lot of them. I think we're going to have a little bit of a rock fight over there in Athens, Georgia, and I think Texas really rolls this weekend against Arkansas. But let's get into a little bit of a wrap-up right here because we got a couple of headlines that I want to get on y'all's radar, and we'll start with one around the Big 12 and the ACC because there are a lot of things going on around the postseason and the future of the postseason in this sport, and there's a lot of different ideas out there. We talked about the college uh, student football league with the College Sports Today group. That's a little bit of a Super League idea, the uh, Project Rudy, which is a ridiculous thing to call a Super League. That is another idea that's out there to possibly, you know, unite all of the Power Four conferences, make them play kind of on their own, get everything out of the uh, purview of the NCAA, move to its own uh, place, and set up shop and see what happens the rest of the way. It sounds like the Big 12 and the ACC uh, presidents, ADs, a lot of the important decision makers in both those party or both those conferences are going to meet uh, later. In about a week or so, I think December 4th is when they've kind of tabbed as the day that they're going to meet, and it's going to be really interesting to see what comes out of that. Now, the big thing to uh, take away from this is everyone was invited. It wasn't just the Big 12 and the ACC that was invited. These two individuals, uh, Tony Petiti, the uh, commissioner for the Big 10, and Greg Sankey were invited to this event does not sound like they're going to go, and that creates some problems. And it's the problems that we've been worried about for quite some time, but it sounds like those two conferences, the ACC and the Big 12, are on a very different page than the SEC and the Big 10. I think right now the SEC and the Big 10 are looking at the next couple of years as Let's just keep as many exit paths open as possible. Give us as many opportunities to possibly take our ball and go play elsewhere if we see fit at the ne- in the next four, five, six years. And then for the ACC and the Big 12, you're saying we just got to get stability. We have to make sure that we are in the fight. We have to make sure that we are at the table going forward in the future because the reality is there is a world where the Big 10 and the SEC break off, create their own football division, play their own championship, and that's the end of it for the ACC and the Big 12. 12, at least in terms of being big time conferences in college football. So that's kind of the battle back and forth. And I really hope that these people put their ego aside and get in a room and figure this thing out. But as of right now, it sounds like they are really fighting back and forth. It sounds like the SEC and the Big Ten are not remotely into the idea of these Super Leagues, and the ACC and the Big 12 might be a little bit more into them because they would be able to have a seat at the table. They would be protected by that agreement. The SEC and the Big Ten don't really need that protection quite as much. They have the ability to say, you know, we'll take a relatively uncertain future because regardless of the uncertainty, We're going to be sitting on top of the pile. So it's going to be a battle back and forth. I hope they can figure this out one way or the other because I don't want to see a reality where we have the SEC and the Big Ten playing over here and the ACC and the Big 12 playing over here. You obviously want them to all be together. Some people are going to have to put their egos aside to get there. So we'll see what happens. Obviously, that has not been necessarily a popular thing to do in college football. So we'll see what happens there, but definitely going to be a battle. And the ACC and the Big 12 seem to be ready for a little bit of a fight. Then we'll get to Bryce Underwood because I'm sure a lot of you saw what the number was that was flying around Twitter the last couple of days. It sounds like Michigan is really trying to get Bryce Underwood and they're more than happy to pay a little bit of money for him. So it sounds like the deal would be $10.5 million over four years. So obviously a little bit less if you were to leave after three years, which this kid's leaving after three years. I'm just going to be totally honest with you, whether it's Michigan or LSU, which he is committed to right now, it's going to be three years. And if you're wondering why we're talking about this kid so much, why we're, you know, leaning so much towards this crazy story that's going on around him, go ahead and watch his tape. This kid might be the next Cam Newton, and I wish I was speaking uh, facetiously. I wish I was exaggerating. I wish I was overreacting. Everyone, and I mean everyone, that knows anything about football that's watched this kid has said he is a program changer. We just watched DJ Lagway come into Florida, give them so much hope and so much uh, energy for the future that they're keeping Billy Napier as their head coach. That's what would happen for a lot of coaches if they hitch their wagon to this kid. He is an absolute difference maker in every sense of the word. He can do everything on the football field that you want him to do. And everyone, even people that know a lot more about football than I do, are saying that this kid is different in every sense of the word and is going to be a problem at the next level. So if you think $10.5 million over four years is too much, 
I promise you it's not. This kid is a program changer, and especially at a place like Michigan, he could make that place known for the offense and quarterback play in three years. He is an absolute game changer, and I think when you talk about this, you're going to have plenty to hear from from LSU, and it sounds like he is leaning in that direction. It sounds like, uh, based on a lot of different social media posts and things of that nature, that he is probably not going to decommit and flip to Michigan. A lot of that stuff changes in a hurry, so we will keep you updated, obviously, but a crazy, crazy deal. A, a one that gives you an idea of just how much money that some of these kids are worth because he is worth that money and also how much money was being held back from a lot of kids uh, the last couple of years. So more power to him. If they're willing to give him 10.5 over four years, I'd take it and run with it. Now, it seems like he's going to go with LSU, but we'll see what happens over the next couple of weeks and whoever gets this kid congratulations. You just got one of the best quarterbacks in the country and probably just got a guy that's going to play really, really well in the NFL and help you out there as well. So he's an incredible player. And although 10.5 sounds absolutely crazy, might end up being a bargain if Michigan can pull this off. But then we'll talk about Diego Pavia. He is suing the NCAA. He's trying to, uh, or actually he was denied a request for a temporary restraining order to grant him another year of eligibility but they got to figure out what the ruling is on this uh, lawsuit going forward. So it's going to be a battle back and forth, and he's arguing that his two seasons playing at a junior college level should not count towards his D1 eligibility. That is an argument that a lot of people have made before. It is an argument that a lot of people will be making coming forward, and he wasn't able to profit from his NIL. That's the argument that he's making. You know, when you're at a junior college, you don't have that ability it's definitely an argument to be had, you know, should he be able to come back one more year because now it's a professional sport. He's being uh, some quote unquote money was taken away from him in this respect. It is definitely an argument back and forth. So it's going to be interesting to watch. They're arguing that he would suffer immediate and irreparable harm if he was not able to play. And more specifically, if he was not able to know if he was allowed to play before the transfer portal opens in on December 9th. So I don't know if he's planning on transferring. I don't know if that's something that he's thinking about. But at the end of the day, it is going to be interesting to watch all of this unfold. December 4th is when the hearing is going to have. If he's granted an injunction, he will get another year in college football, and Diego Pavia, whether it's at Vanderbilt or somewhere else, will be a quarterback in college football for another year. I think a lot of us would love to see that. I'd love to see him in a Vander uniform next year, so hopefully him uh, you know, wanting to know before the transfer portal is just making sure that this happens very quickly and not him wanting to leave, but as of right now, it's going to be a battle back and forth, and we'll see if Diego Pavia is able to get a little bit of an injunction here and continue playing in college football. I'd lean that he will, but we'll see what happens there. Definitely going to be a battle, and it's one of those things where you got a couple new arguments to deal with if you're the NCAA when it comes to eligibility moving forward. And then we got to talk about USC. USC got a one-year probation and was fined $50,000 for an NCAA investigation that basically said the uh, football program exceeded permissible numbers of coaches uh of countable coaches by six during the two academic years of 2022 and 2023. Essentially, just saying they had wait, they had too many coaches at practice, too many coaches participating in active coaching throughout the week. There's different kind of measures for how many coaches you're allowed to have out of practice, how many coaches you're allowed to have on the field, that type of thing, and they seem to have violated that. It's also certain analysts are restricted from, pra uh, from a practice and having film review six consecutive days for four weeks in the 2024 season. It's very confusing, all the conjecture, but the question about this is, this is relatively minor news. It's relatively minor things, relatively minor punishments, because let's be honest, $50,000 is chump change for a lot of these uh, universities around there. But at the end of the day, why is it coming out now? has been the question that a lot of people have around, and I'm not saying that Lincoln Riley's in a bad spot. I'm not saying that Lincoln Riley's in a position where he's going to get fired. I am saying that if he loses this weekend, this could be a reason that a lot of people come after him. This could be a reason that the boosters come and say, maybe we should move on from him. As crazy as that sounds, I think a lot of this news coming out and being kind of bigger news than it probably should be might be a little bit telling of what's going on over there at USC. I'm not necessarily saying anything definitively, and I'm not necessarily betting that Lincoln Riley gets fired. I'm just saying there's a lot of stuff in the air, and this would not be a big deal, but it seems like it's becoming a big deal over there in L.A., and we'll see what happens the rest of the way, but definitely something to watch, and we'll keep you updated as it unfolds. But 
Let's get to some injury updates. As we head into this weekend, there's a ton of things you guys need to know, and the biggest thing around Tennessee, Georgia, is Nico Imaliava. He is questionable, as well as Dante Thornton. They are both questionable for this game. I have a feeling they're both going to end up going. I don't necessarily have any intel on that, but definitely feel like it, a lot of things are trending in the right direction uh, around there, so... I would bet Nico's going to be out there. I don't know how close to 100% he's going to be, so still very much up in the air how much of an effect he'll have, but definitely something to watch, and we'll uh, hopefully we'll know more by the end of tonight and maybe going into tomorrow. And then Trevor Etienne is going to be out for this one for Georgia. That's the other big news here. Huge blow to that run game, especially with Cash Jones already banged up in that running back room. Sounds like it's Nate Frazier time for Georgia. It sounds like he's going to have to be the guy that kind of carries them to a win here, at least in the run game. I bet that guy right there, Dylan Bell, is going to get a couple of carries as well. Used to be more of a running back threat, so I would bet he's going to get plenty of run from that position as well. But a couple of losses for both these teams that could put them in a really, really bad spot. Obviously, Nico, a huge deal, and Trevor Etienne is one where this run game has really struggled as of late. They cannot take any more hits, and that's a really tough one. Then you got Pitt Clemson, a little bit of an update here. Eli Holstein has not been cleared to play yet. He's going to be a game-time decision. I don't know if he's going to play or not. I think he probably would. He's one of those guys that you're probably going to have to drag him off the field if you don't want him to play, and especially with how important this game is. I'd bet that he goes, but we'll see what happens. Nate Yarnell, uh, Nate Yarnell has been a solid player for them. I'd be surprised if he was able to go out and win this one, but definitely something to watch as we get a little bit closer. Eli Holstein not quite cleared yet. I'm going to bet on him to play, but don't feel necessarily all that great about it. And then for Clemson, the big news here is Peter Woods, the absolute beast of a defensive lineman. He's going to play in this game. He will be back, and that's huge for Clemson in this run defense that if they can slow down this pit run game, it's going to be a nightmare day for the Panthers. I can promise you that. But a couple other little things. DJ Lagway is expected to go for Florida. He's expected to be back. And I think the big thing here is it's a huge recruiting weekend for Florida. If they can get this win and Napier can send a message to this program, this thing could get rolling in a hurry. There's a lot of rumors around a lot of players that one decommitted from Florida State yesterday, a couple others are out around there that are committed to other programs. Maybe Florida has something cooking if they can get DJ Lagway on that field and get a big time win. But let me get this uh, from Anthony before we get out of here. I have a serious fear that the playoff committee, even if either they're going to give it. Oh, so here's the thing, uh, Anthony, for the top four seeds, that just goes to the top four conference champions. So whether it's a, you know, one loss SEC or a one loss Big Ten, the closest they could get is a five seed if they do not win the conference. So uh, BYU, SMU, Miami, they wouldn't be in a position regardless, really, if they were able to win their conference to get that three in that four spot. Moving forward, we'll see what happens if they kind of, you know, debate that in the offseason. I tend to think they will, but I do think uh, they are safe, at least for this year. The question will become after that, you know, say SMU were to lose in that championship game and go 11-2, and or BYU were to go undefeated and lose in that championship game. Would they get in over a 10-2 and Tennessee or a 10-2 and Ole Miss or a 10-2 and Alabama? That's going to be the battle back and forth that I think we're going to have, but in terms of them getting a top-four seed— that won't be an issue as long as they win their conference. They will get that top four seed and will get that bye in the first week. So that's not uh, so much the issue that I'm worried about. The at-large bids are going to be really interesting to watch, no doubt about that. Um, the reason I'm saying that is how they're determining the rankings now is yeah, I, I, I do understand where you're, where you're coming from for, with that, and I think the rankings are going to be a little bit confusing over the next couple of weeks as they try to figure out what the balance is between who's playing well in their specific conference, who's in the tougher conference, who's playing the tougher schedule. All of that stuff is going to be really, really tough to iron out. I do think it's going to put the ACC and the Big 12 in a really tough spot as we get closer. I've said I think they're going to be a one-bid league, and I'm feeling better and better about that as we get closer and closer to this thing. Maybe BYU can get it done if they lose in their conference championship as an undefeated team, but other than that, I don't necessarily see a path forward, and that is part of the reason we're going to have to figure out just a different way forward in the grand scheme of things when we talk about this playoff. But a little bit more injury news here as we head, as we roll up. Or, round up this show. Brady Cook is not going to play in this game. Mookie Cooper is also out for Missouri this upcoming weekend against South Carolina. It is going to be Drew Pine, and we'll see what happens from there. They were able to win one last week, but 
a lot of a taller order this upcoming week against South Carolina. And then Jordan James is questionable for Oregon against Wisconsin. He is didn't play last week. I wouldn't necessarily expect him to play this week, but definitely something to watch, especially if he's out for multiple weeks going forward. But That'll do it for this edition of the GSMC College Football Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Sports Network. Your support means a lot to us, so please remember to subscribe to the show, leave a positive review. It does make a huge difference for us. Also, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, all the social pages for all the content and updates you could possibly need. We have great people covering every sport you could possibly want, so anything in the world of sports you could possibly need, we got you totally covered over here at GSMC. But thank you once again for listening, and I will see you guys on Monday to break down on this crazy week 12.